Today, we're going to hear from Professor Tommy Curry. Uh, Professor Curry is Chair in Africana Philosophy and Black Male Studies at the University of Edinburgh. He is the author of many influential articles um, and at least two so far, uh, very successful award-winning books, including The Man Not, Race, Class, Genre, and the Dilemmas of Black Manhood, and White Man's, Another White Man's Burden, Josiah Royce's Quest for a Philosophy of White Racial Empire. And we're delighted to have him speak with us today, and his talk will be The Physiognomic Origins of the Ethnological Justifications for Enslavement, colon, a historiography towards evolutionary racial sciences. And uh, Professor Curry will speak for 45 minutes, which I'm gonna start from now, and then we'll have half hour for questioning. Professor Curry, thank you. Uh, you probably wouldn't know that the colon was a dig at the length of the title. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so thank everyone for coming, uh, you know, especially with the, the race COVID. Uh, this, this paper is really an exploration of what I take to be several different developmental moves in racialist science from the time of the Enlightenment all the way to the mid 19th century. Many of the ways that we study race within the historiography of the Enlightenment era is to focus on figure-based assessments. And what I mean by that is that we're debating over whether or not Kant was racist, what's the meaning of Hume's footnote. If we talk about Herder's internal history, we're doing it in a relationship to trying to draw a distinction to Kant, et cetera. And what that does is it often allows us to neglect how racialist sciences were actually being developed given the resources and the improving scholarship or what they thought were improving the scholarship during that period of time. So what I wanna to do today is give you an overview of how Enlightenment era thinking contributed to physiognomy, now physiognomic sciences and analysis created a justification for enslavement primarily around the issue of how man should rule over beast in the early 1800s, okay? So the debate over the philosophical significance and historiographic impact of racism and colonialism in the writings of Enlightenment era thinkers is ongoing and far from over. The recent pressure majority white disciplines are under to decolonize have not only emboldened more radical departures from canonical interpretations of Enlightenment era philosophers, but has also inspired traditionalists who aim to limit the scope of decolonial critique and preserve the importance of these foundational figures. In the mid 1990s, my late professor Emmanuel Eze released Race and the Enlightenment, a reader. Now Eze's work argued for reconsideration of the commonly accepted notion that Enlightenment era thinkers sought to expand freedom and the rational potential of the autonomous individual. As Eze writes in the introduction to Race and the Enlightenment, quote, the ordinary title of this book has a remarkable history. It went under numerous titles, one of which stands out, Racist Enlightenment. This was meant to draw attention to the racist comments of some of the chosen essays, which were about varieties of human beings. As they attempted to bring attention to what has historically been ignored in the corpus of Enlightenment philosophers. According to Eze, quote, Racist Enlightenment as a title could only have been more broadly significant to characterize as well as draw attention to a hidden and perhaps forgotten aspect of science and philosophy in the 18th century, namely the Enlightenment discourse of race. The debates over the racism of Enlightenment era thinkers often focus on the racist distinctions philosophers such as Hume, Kant, Hegel, and Locke made about black people that justified slavery. These debates, however, have not significantly shifted the conceptual ground upon which the Enlightenment and Enlightenment era thinkers are interpreted throughout are engaged. The philosophical anthropology of the thinker, their development of racial distinctions, and the negative comments about various racial groups have not motivated the rethinking of their canonical position over the last decades, despite the proliferations of essays and books dedicated to the racist history of modernity. The resulting scholarship gives the appearance of parity, a division of sorts, where scholars simply disagree about the interpretation of specific figures and texts. This, however, is not the case. The statements by Hume, Kant, etc., were utilized by various 19th century ethnologists and pro-slavery advocates as evidence of black inferiority and servitude. The figure-based debates that consistently indulge the question of an Enlightenment figure's racism often ignore how those starts were organized and who cited these ideas to justify the enslavement of Africans, as well as the historiographic rendering of Africa and Asia outside the realm of civilization. So this paper would like to take an approach different from the existing literature. I will argue that the rise of physiognomy as a science of art, 
of interpreting the inside characteristics from exterior features of bodies was the basis of the ethological justifications for slavery in the early 1800s. Rather than engage in an endless debate concerning racism and light and error philosophers, I aim to show how their ideas were used to legitimize assertions concerning moral difference and human standing towards black people. So what is the physiognomic construction of subpersonhood? The development of racial sciences during the enlightenment was not only about the delineation between superior white races and inferior black races, but the idea that character or the general tendencies and moral dispositions of a group were expressed through an individual. While one would be hard pressed to deny the truth of the late Charles Mills that quote, the modern period brought race into the existence as an infallible epistemic marker that conveniently linked inferior biology with inferior culture thereby dividing the population covered by the natural law framework into persons and subpersons, very little focus has been paid to how race is in fact an epistemic marker that indeed reflects the qualities or character of a subperson. The general characterization of black people by modern philosophers became a metric by which individual blacks in the 1700s and all blacks in the 1800s would be described and ordered. And of national characteristic, or I'm sorry, of national characters, David Hume writes that, quote, he is apt to suspect that Negroes and in general all other species of men, for there are four or five different kinds, to be the naturally to be naturally inferior to the whites. There was never a civilization, civilized nation of any other complexion than white, nor even any individual eminent either in action or speculation. No is genius manufacturers amongst them, no arts, no sciences, end quote. Now, this footnote describes an uncertainty Hume has concerning the relationship between climate and the character of groups situated at the extremities of temperatures in the North Cold and the extreme Southern tropics. Hume entertains the idea that physical causes such as air and climate act, quote, insensibly on the temper by altering the tone and habit of the body and giving for a particular complexion, which the reflection and reason may sometimes overcome it, yet will prevail amongst generality of mankind and have influence over manners, end quote. However, Hume is not sure that the national character of groups in extreme elements can be accurately attributed to climate, since they are also certain that, quote, characters of nations are very promiscuous in the temperate climates, and almost all the general observations which have been formed of the more southern and more northern people in these climates are found to be uncertain and fallacious, end quote. Negro inferiority, however, is a surety for him. Almost exceptional since neither slavery nor education has been able to offer a demonstration of ingenuity for the Negro. In the one case of the Jamaican man who appeared to be educated and learned, Hume was quick to reassure us as readers that quote, it is likely he is admired for slender accomplishments like a parrot who speaks but a few words plainly, end quote. Similarly, we see a statement by Kant in observations of the beautiful and the sublime. Following Hume, Kant concludes that, quote, Negroes of Africa have by nature no feeling that rises above the ridiculous. Kant continues, Mr. Hume challenges anyone to adduce a single example where a Negro has demonstrated talents and asserts that among the hundreds and thousands of blacks who have been transported elsewhere from their culture or countries, although very many of them have been set free, nevertheless, not a single one has ever been found who has accomplished. Upon learning of a comment by a black carpenter criticizing whites for how they treat their wives, Kant replied, there might be something here worth considering, except for the fact that this scoundrel was completely black from head to toe, as distinct proof that what he said was stupid. Now, Kant's formulations of racism not only speak to the failures of the black race, but remark upon what he takes to be the character of the race itself. To quote Charles Mills again, Kant, the preeminent enlightenment theorist of personhood and the founder of the modern concept of race, was thus in a sense finally the preeminent theorist of subpersonhood also. He mapped out a natural racial hierarchy of degrees of human rationality and moral education ability in which it turns out that Native Americans are at the bottom, being completely impervious to such education, whereas blacks one rung above have innate abilities no more extensive than would equip them for slavery or servitude, end quote. Unlike Hume, Kant does believe that climate has a noticeable effect on the qualities that come to dictate and determine racial features. In all of his writings on physical geography, Kant argues that, quote, in the hot countries, the human being matures in all aspects earlier, but does not, however, reach the perfection of those in the temperate zones. Humanity in its 
at its greatest perfection in the race of whites. The yellow Indians have a meager talent. The Negroes are far below them. And at the lowest point are the part of the American people, end quote. So Kant believed that geography and climate did in fact create something enduring, if not permanent in the makeup of the group subjected to the repetitive forces of nature. So the origins of different races was due to the interaction between the race's interior seas or the kind and the external world. And of different human races, Kant develops his theory of races, diff racial differences farther. He writes, quote, the causes lying in the nature of an organic body, plant or animal, that account for the specific development of development of changes are called seeds when this development concerns a particular part of the plant or the animal. When the natural dispositions or the body, uh, the environment then brings out of the species certain adaptations. Kant uses, for example, birds of the same species that have a new layer of feathers in cold climates, but are without these feathers in warmer climates. So the variety of human beings, however, have more enduring characteristics that are already inborn. Kant believes that human beings were created in such a way that they might live in every climate and endure each and every condition of land. So there are numerous seeds and natural dispositions that must be already in human beings, either to be developed or held back in such a way that we might become fitted to a particular place in the world. These seeds and natural dispositions appear to be inborn made for these conditions through an ongoing process of reproduction. Races, however, then have certain natural capacities of inhabitability, but their group potentiality is solidified over time through reproduction. The seed that each racial group possesses affects their development and provides the basis for ascertaining the end of said development through observation. In his 1784 essay, Idea for a Universal History with Cosmopolitan Intent, Kant advances two theses of particular interest to how we come to understand group difference. The first is that, quote, all creatures' natural capacities are destined to develop completely and in conformity with their end. So much like Bernard Boxel's case for naming Kant's racial teleology, Kant has deliberate, a deliberate pattern of racialist thinking in his interpretation of history. The second thesis, which is of particular interest, is the claim that, quote, in man as the sole rational creature on earth, those natural capacities directed towards the use of his reason are to be completely developed only in the species, not in the individual. To fully use the capacities of reason would require individuals to live for an exceptionally long time, right? Since Kant thought that an individual had to try reason, get it wrong, learn again, et cetera, it has to be active and activated. But since the lifetime of the individual is short in the species of man, the development of the seed that allows the gains to indiv for individuals must be transmitted as a feature of the group or the race. So group characteristics that become solidified over time throughout history is at the foundation of modern theories of racial thinking. This is perhaps the most interesting aspect of the philosophical anthropology extending from the late 1700s forward, given the emphasis that liberal political theorists and social contactarian theorists place on the autonomous individual. So the philosophical conceptualization of the individual is not only limited by the history of the group, but primarily determined by this lineage. The time then operates not only to affect the expression of the physical body of the species, but also ties the individual to the group character. And this is one of the, the most fascinating aspects of, of, of this kind of philosophical anthropology, is that you have a, a development of an autonomous individual that's rational. And what we've traditionally thought of is, well, you have positive accounts of a rational individual, and you have negative accounts of Black people, other non-white groups. What I'm trying to suggest is, at the same time that you have this person versus subperson distinction that people like Mills has already brought to our attention, you also have another kind of philosophy developing, the question of how the individual is a particular expression of the seeds and destiny or lineage of its group. And it's this aspect of group development character that's going to serve as the basis of how the origin and moral qualities of the group serve to indicate how individuals of those particular races should be treated and why they should be enslaved. But I continue to Hegel very quickly. Hegel's commentary on the Negro in Africa actually serves as a grounding of the ethnology utilized in America regarding enslaved Africans. In the philosophy of history, Hegel writes, quote, in Negro life, the characteristic point is the fact that consciousness has not yet been attained to the realization of any substantial objective existence, as for example, God or law, in which the interest of man's volition is involved and in which he realizes his own being. Hegel believed that Africa had no notion of the other or a higher power outside of their own existence. He thereby concludes that, quote, 
the Negro exhibits the natural man in his completely wild and untamed state. Because the slave was thought to have no knowledge of his selfhood or the human soul, the Negro was thought to be completely sensual. For this race, human flesh is but an object of sense, mere flesh, knows no meaning beyond its perception. So the sensual savage Negro was trapped in the natural condition of being, a stage of absolute and thorough injustice. The Negro was thought to have no spiritual or reflective consciousness of its existence, so slavery was a means of developing the Negro. Hegel is adamant that, quote, slavery is itself a phase of advancement from the merely isolated sensual existence, a phase of education, a mode of becoming participant in a higher morality and culture connected with it. So while Hegel believed that, quote, slavery is in and of itself injustice for the essence of humanity is freedom, the Negro is the exception for this man must be matured. Hegel's depiction of the Negro was not the ramblings of a simple racist posing as a philosopher, though we do have tons of examples of those. Hegel's lectures on the philosophy of world history spanned from 1822 to 1831. And this time period is gonna become very, very important when we get to the notions of ethnology. So Hegel is in fact writing arguments about sensuality and the destiny of the black race whether or not they're removed or part of the realm of history and by, by effect civilization. At the same, the same time that you have the rise of ethnological sciences in the United States and the UK. And the reason that this is important is because the ethnographic tradition, which is basically ethnology in Germany, was situated 20 to 30 years earlier. So Hegel is actually writing as a product of where he has some kind of proto notion of evolution and development through actual dialectical reasoning, like putting people in a situation and seeing if their kind responds in, in Kantian terms. Whereas the Anglo tradition is 20 years late in trying to figure out the origins and development of racial species. So these, over, these lectures overlapped Hegel's revision to his Encyclopedia of Philosophical Sciences and conveyed what was considered the world's most advanced thinking as to the nature of the African. The description of the African as sensuous and not beyond the raw state of nature was not isolated to the colonial apologetics of Europeans. In the United States, the sensual nature of the Negro was used to justify the modernization of the American slave institution. Thomas Jefferson expressed a similar view in 1779, his notes on Virginia saying of the Negro that, quote, in general, their existence appears to participate more of sensation than reflection. To this must be ascribed their disposition to sleep when abstracted from their diversions and unemployed in labor. An animal whose body is at rest and who does not reflect must be disposed to sleep, of course. Though Jefferson's statement was in, statement was in the latter half of the 18th century, George Shroud's The Sketch of Law Relating to Slavery in 1856 showed that Thomas Jefferson's ideas of the Negro was widely cited in support of American slavery within numerous states in the 19th century. So these observations about the laziness, the sensual nature and character of the Negro were actually developed more in the field or science of physiognomy. In 1800, John Caspar Lavater authored Physiognomy or the corresponding analogy between the conformity of the features and the ruling passions of the mind. Lavater believed that physiognomy held the promise of understanding and ordering racial difference. Physiognomy, he writes, is, quote, as capable of becoming a science as any one of the sciences, mathematics accepted. It is a branch of the physical art. It includes theology and the bell letters. Like these, it may to a certain extent be reduced to rule and acquire an appropriate character by which it may be taught." End quote. The primary concern of the physiognomy, wait, the primary concern of the physiognomical was how the exterior features of the racial body could be described as a marker of difference between groups and how that exterior difference indicated internal qualities the individual possessed through their membership to a racial group. So physiognomy is built on an empirically obvious and intuitive claim for Lavater, namely, quote, that it is indisputable that all men, absolutely all men, estimate all things whatever by their physiognomy, their exterior temporary superficies. By viewing these on every occasion, they draw their conclusions concerning their internal properties. So physiognomy is thought to be demonstrated by the innate capacity of human beings to read nature. He writes, quote, it is not, not, is not all nature physiognomy, superficials and contents, body and spirit, exterior effect and internal power, invisible beginning, invisible end. Lavater asks, 
Is not physiognomy the origin of all human decisions, efforts, actions, expectations, fears, and hope of pleasing and unpleasing sensation, which are occasioned by external objects? So physiognomy was not only a tool for understanding the sky or the outward appearance of the sick. It also indicated the position and hierarchy of racial kinds and characters. According to Lavater, it is undeniable that there is a national physiognomy as well as national character. Whosoever doubts this can never be observed men of different nations, nor have compared inhabitants of the extreme confines of any two. Compare a Negro and an Englishman, a native of Latin and an Italian, a Frenchman and an inhabitant of Terra de Fuego. Examine their forms, countenances, characters, and minds, end quote. So the individual then becomes the indication of the character of the nation or the group. And this, again, is what's so fascinating, right, that, that Lavater develops a system at the end of the 1700s and the 1800s that is saying the way that we observe, the way that we have an epistemology of somatology, the way that we look at bodies, then tells us about their interiority, what their moral qualities are. And those moral qualities that we obtain from this observation then draw us immediately to the origins and development of the racial group. So the reason that climate becomes so important here, which is what's important to the Enlightenment era thinkers, physical geography, right, as is distinct from pragmatic anthropology, is that there's a certain interaction between the external forces of nature and what develops inside of us. The science of determining what that is, how we read that in the world, is the job of physiognomy. So that means that physiognomy plays a very important role in allowing us to connect what's ultimately on the inside of whole populations and a product of what we would now call evolution and their outward appearance, their skin color and their facial, facial phenotype, right? So, the, so, so this is why he says that individual countenances discover more the characteristic of a whole nation than a whole nation does that which is national in individuals, end quote. So one of the arguments that Pauline Kleingold advances is that in the late 1790s, Immanuel Kant had second thoughts regarding racial hierarchy and colonialism. So she explains in Kant's second thoughts of colonialism that, quote, Kant's defense of racial hierarchy and the associated racial characterizations never constituted the central category of his articles on race to begin with. The central category of those essays in Kant's eyes was his determination of the concept of race, and he never renounced that concept as such. Kleingold maintains that Kant's revising of his racial views are evident because, quote, Kant chose not to publish his earlier account of the racial hierarchies in the one place where it did constitute the central category of the discussion, namely in the section on the character of the races in the anthropology from a pragmatic point of view. This was the section heading under which Kant standardly expounded his account of racial hierarchy each year, and he did so in the last lecture series, which he asked, we have student notes, dating from 1791 to 1792. However, in part two of the anthropology, Kant does devote a considerable amount of time explaining how physiognomy is the basis of anthropological induction in a section dedicated to the understanding of anthropological characteristics on the way of cognizing the interior of the human being from the exterior. Kant explicitly mentions that physiognomy is, quote, the art of judging a human being's way of sensing or way of thinking according to his visible form. Consequently, it judges the interior by the exterior, end quote. While Kant does not have an extended treatment of race, particularly the Negro race, he does articulate what he thinks to be the physiognomic characteristics of individuals and how these individual descriptions are tied to larger group characteristics. Johann Lavater once wrote to Kant that said, quote, until we fix our observations more on human beings, all of our wisdom is folly. That the reason we always fell so horribly into error is that we seek to find outside of us what is only within us. So Lavater insists that the way to scientifically account for the impressions of other human beings we receive from the outside world is through physiognomy. Lavater quotes extensively from Kant, specifically a passage arguing that the air and the sun appear to be these causes which most influence the powers of propagation and affect a durable development of germ and propensities. That is to say, the air and the sun may be the origin of a distinct race. From Winkelmann's theory of art, art Lavater claims, quote, with respect to the form of man, our eyes convince us that the character of a nation as well as a mind is visible in the countenance. So physiognomy developed as a science which sought to attain some knowledge of the heart of man, his origin and manner from his facial features. Throughout Lavater's treatise, there is an insistence that the exteriority of racial groups represent primary modes of being about that group 
and explain how the perfection of man emanate from his interior order. Lavater says, physiognomy discovers actual and possible perfections, which without its aid must ever remain hidden. The more man is studied, the more power and positive goodness he will be discovered to possess, end quote. So the rise of physiognomy as a science into the interior nature of perfection and flaw among racial groups became an identifiable source of support within the literature and debates concerning slavery in the United States and the United Kingdom in the early 1800s. The insights of Enlightenment era physiognomy was translated into debates about the origins and ends of racial groups in the mid 1800s. In 1842, for instance, Albert Gallatin and John Burlett founded the American Ethnological Society in the United States, while the Ethnological Society of London was founded the next year in 1843 by Thomas Hodgkin, John Bedeau, and James Pritchard. So while ethnology was only beginning or becoming more widely used, the primary debates of racial of race focus primarily on the origins of the races and the biblical interpretation for the justification of slavery as revealed by God. The origins and moral status of racial groups were not solely based on the geographical and moral qualities that manifested themselves. During the 1800s, slavery became a question of how philosophers and ethnologists could utilize the presumed qualities of the Negro to draw from divine creation a theory of racial order and subjugation. And this transition is extremely important. So you have in the Enlightenment era, lots of debates about the origins, the constitution of what comprises a different racial group. Because Khan is looking at this as basically, as race is basically a mark of a certain kind of geography, right? That I go to a different country, the people's skin tone change, this is a different race. There's a certain obviousness to that. Laverture was not content with that because there was a certain enduring effect that we found in the debates with Blumenbach, Boffin, Kant, Hegel, et cetera. So the question is, how do we then, as a, as a philosophical phenomenon, understand the meaning of the differences in facial features or skin tone that we observe? How do we extract the meanings or the teleology behind what the seed is actually trying to do in these bodies? So physiognomy is invented. Now, the debates about slavery during this period of time change because it is not a question of whether or not there has, there's a right to enslave Black people or not a right to enslave Black people. There's a question that given the move of nature and the divine authorship of God, do we have a way of understanding the natural position of black people as subservient? Said differently, in the antebellum ethnological era, which is going to run from 18, basically the, roughly the 1800s to like 1860, the primary debate around ethnology was whether or not black people or the Negro was man. And if he was not man and was beast, Slavery was justified because God gave man the right to rule over beast. This debate will change in the postbellum because with the advent of Darwinism, the question is, what is the ethnological character of race and how does it evolve over time? And tell us something about how racial hierarchies are broken up. What we've traditionally done in studying Enlightenment era justifications for slavery is debate whether or not the arguments were strong or weak in favor of enslaving certain groups of people. And when we've concluded, because politically we're all against slavery, that these are weak arguments, we then deem that person racist, right? Like Locke, for instance, okay? But the problem with that is that those aren't the arguments that were garnering popular support. The arguments stood, but the way that we became socialized throughout the West to accept slavery as a natural condition was through ethnology and physiognomy, right? So I was picking on Pritchard just because I'm in, I'm in the UK. In 1813, James Cowell Pritchard authored Researches into Physical History of Man. Pritchard maintained that the natural and causes of physical diversities which characterize different races of men through a curious and interesting subject of inquiry is one which rarely engaged the noticed writers of our own country. And now this is a fascinating remark that he puts in the introduction of his book because at a, as a British scholar, he's saying, look, Britain doesn't really have ethnological scientists that are asking this question about racial variation. Because during this period of time, if you're following Hans Vermeulen's book, most of the arguments were coming out of Germany, right? Or they were gonna come from America because you have a lot of pro-slavery advocates. But what you don't have is a kind of link in the popular imagination, right? In, in what we would think of as social science as justifications for enslavement, right? He continues that he wrote his inquiry into the physical history of mankind on hearing it treated by the professor of late moral philosophy at the University of Edinburgh, who 
whose unrivaled powers of elegance never failed to impart a lively interest even to the most sterile and unpleasing speculations. Following the arguments of Lavater, Kant, and Hume, Pritchard accepted that climate-based physiognomy was in fact correct and indisputable. Like his 18th century predecessors, Pritchard presumed that the study of racial variation was rooted in the geographical and external imposition of forces upon a population. However, in thinking of the origins of human species, he introduced an idea of evolutionary progress or transmutation of racial kinds from the pigmentation of the darker races towards that of the white races. He writes that it must be concluded that in the process of nature, in the human species is the transmutation of the characters of the Negro into those of the European, or the evolution of white varieties in black races of men. We have seen that there are causes existing which are capable of producing such an alteration, but we have no facts which induce us to suppose that the reverse of this change could in any circumstance be effected. This leads us to the inference that the primitive stock of men were Negroes, which has every appearance to truth." End quote. So this proto-evolutionary account of ethnological reasoning among British thinkers prefigures rising discussions concerning the status of the Negro and his closest to that of the beast. Pritchard's considerations suggest a delineation between the progressive and civilized racial types, such as Europeans and the Negro, who were closer to the state of nature. He asserts that, quote, the dark races are best adapted by their organization to the condition of rude and uncivilized nations, which we must conceive to have been primitive states of mankind, that the structure of the European is best fitted for the habits of improved life. Underlying this delineation in Pritchard is the idea that nature aims to improve itself, that, quote, all laws of nature have a beneficial tendency, and among others, this law of deviation in the species of animals. So the Negro is more suited for servitude, according to Pritchard. And this is important. Notice what, notice what Pritchard actually did to, to the physiognomic character. He says, look, if we have an idea of evolution, then the European is unsuitable for servitude, right? That we think when we look at races that are in more temperate climates, they're, they're more delicate, right? And because they're more delicate, they can't handle the rugged work that enslavement entails. He actually goes so far to say that the Negro is particularly adapted to the wild or the natural state of life. His dense and firm fiber renders him much more able to endure fatigue and the inclemencies of the season than the European with his lax fiber and delicate constitution. The scents are more perfect in Negroes than in Europeans, especially those which are the most important to the savage and less necessary to the civilized man, like smell, taste, and hearing. This perfection of the ruder faculties of sense is simply not required in a civilized state, end quote. So antebellum theories of race insisted upon a more theological account of racial variation than the previous physiognomic accounts. Consequently, physical history and the racial variation that comprise the distinctions between stocks of men require divine design. In the introduction to the researchers, uh, our researches into physical history of man, Pritchard quotes a 1792 speech by Sir William Jones entitled The Origins of Family and Nations. In that essay, Jones asserts that the racial variation that can be observed in nature because, quote, nature of which simplicity appears to be a distinguishing attribute does nothing in vain. So it follows that the author of nature, for all nature proclaims its divine author, created but one pair of our species, yet had it not been among other reasons for the devastations which history has recorded of water and fire, flames, famine, and pestilence, this earth would not have now had room for multiple inhabitants. So if the human race be then, as may be confidently assumed, of one natural species, they must all have proceeded from one pair. Right? Notice the biblical interpretation driving this, right? So the great flood would come to be the defining characteristic of this time and the basis of how one would come to rationalize works concerning the freedom or subservience of the black race. Now, there's so much ethnological literature here that I didn't want to bore you with details, so I'm going to give you a cliff notes version for the sake of time. The argument following this announcement, right, about ethnology introduced the question of what did God intend for racial groups and kinds? This was based in the Diluvian epoch. So if you read any ethnology from the 1800s forward, you're going to find them talk about Noah's Ark and the flood. And the idea here was that God decimated the world so that races could start anew. Now, the ethnological debate at the turn of the 1800s, at the birth of this, of this new, new century, was over two questions. One, did races develop from, the sons, from Noah's sons on the Ark? 
right? On one hand, you had the ethnologists in Britain and the United States that said, yes, everybody was on the ark and the curse of Ham created black people. That's one ethno antebellum anthological view, okay? So because black people were cursed, ta-da, you should be enslaved. The other view, which is the more insidious American view, is that black people were not on the ark, that they were not one of the sons of Noah. So that means that they were beasts. So they walked onto the ark in pairs as a beast rather than man. Now, this central debate is what dictated the flow of slavery in the Anglo world for almost 60 to 70 years. And this is why there's such a disconnect between our writings behind the Enlightenment era and then kind of the just viscerally brutish racism that you see coming out of these early 1800 ethnologists. So what we're trying to figure out then, or I think what's really interesting in this kind of history of ideas, is how these ethnologists that were justifying the inferiority of Black people did so on the basis that Black people, especially Black men, were beasts that God intended the white race to rule over. And this has tons of implications for our modern categories, like gender and evolution. But in this sense, one of the reasons that it becomes important is because the responses that Black people are using against ethological science is the proclamation that they are man. Frederick Douglass, for instance, in his address to the ethnological societies in 1854, makes this claim that if Black people were in fact animal, why then does the chicken crow as if it meets a master or the, ho or the horse by its head so that the man, a Black man could ride him? These intuitive observations were part of the debate between these groups. And this is what launched, right? Anti-slavery activism. The misconception that many people have throughout history is that you had black people like Douglas or David Walker simply drawing from enlightenment precepts to prove that they're human. But when you actually read their treatises, they don't. They're responding specifically to the physiognomic and ethological arguments suggesting that they don't have the right to rule. And this is why throughout the 1800s, the primary reference to black freedom was not Enlightenment era thinkers, it was the Haitian Revolution, because they were looking at Haiti and said, we have a right to self-determination and we can rule ourselves under our own republic, hence we are men, right? So these arguments, if you're tracing black ethological thinking, directly correspond to how black people are looking at the European project. If you look at someone like Antonin Furman, for instance, who was a Haitian anthropologist, right at the end of the uh, the end of the uh, 1800s, or even if you're looking at someone like um, Baron Vast de Pape, who are making the same arguments about the development of racial science at the same time, black people are tracing the Enlightenment era thinker from Hume, Kant, et cetera, into this manifestation of physiognomy and ethnology. Right. So it gives us a different path in, in, in view of ideas. So that being said, let's look at the argument for the justification of enslavement. In an 1860 article entitled The Unity of the Human Race Disproved by the Hebrew Bible, Samuel Cartwright expressed the wholehearted belief that the Negro man was created as a beast that ruined Eve. Making a careful distinction between the Hebrew and the English translations of the 24th verse in the first chapter of Genesis, Cartwright concludes that God created a beast of the earth, different in kind from that of Adam, who is a superior race of Nefesh Shaya. Cartwright believed that God made an inferior man who was the slave of the devil. Interpreting the finders of the biblical commentator Adam Clark, Cartwright writes, quote, the creature that beguiled Eve was an animal formed like man, walked erect, and had the gift of speech and reason. He believed it was an orangutan and not a serpent. If he had lived in Louisiana instead of England, he would have recognized the Negro gardener, end quote. So basically, we're the devil, right? And actually, this isn't too bad, because if you're reading Bucknell Payne, we're actually servants of the devil because we're a race of snakes that serve the serpent, right? But this is the kind of ethological characterizations that are trying to philosophize from the exterior the kinds of interior origins of the Black race. So in the years preceding the end of the Civil War, White ethnologists sought to convey to the American public the dangers of an unshackled black male and reclaim what was meant by the use of the word man. Cartwright insists that the Jeffersonian use of this word in the Declaration of Independence was Hebraic, referring only to the Adamitic race and its descendants. He writes, quote, for 1500 years, the Adamitic race had appropriated the term man and mankind exclusively to itself. 
During these 1500 years, when you see the term man in our English translation, we will find Adam in Hebrew. So Mr. Jefferson used the term men in the Declaration of Independence in his original Hebrew sense, wrote Cotwright. The Negro was thought to be a natural slave or the best slave. So his enslavement would require, quote, no military force to keep them in subjugation, no prisons to hold them, and no chains to bind them, end quote. In his 60, 1861 book, Negroes and Negro Slavery, The First and Inferior Race, The Latter is Normal Condition, John Van Every continued the great efforts of ethnologists that assured the world that the Negro race, as indicated by a, quote, careful study of its male sex, was meant for servitude. Like Cartwright, who wrote that Negroes are all knee benders, literally and metaphorically knee benders in mind and body. And this is a very important physiological and, and physiognomic distinction, right? That because they're meant for servitude, they're, they couldn't stand upright. They were always bowed, right? So the accounts that you're getting from physiognomists, both in terms of looking at the body and the countenance of what they're supposed to be, and the ethnologists, which are trying to figure out the origins and ends of the race themselves, are noting that there's physiological distinctions that make them fit for servitude. So John Van Every also noted that manhood was anatomically unattainable for the Negro male. The Negro writes Van Every is incapable of an erect or direct perpendicular posture. The tout ensemble of the anatomical form forbids an erect position. So Van Every believed that the white man actually represented the perfect masculine form of the races. He writes that quote, the form or figure of the Caucasian is perfectly erect with the eyes on a plane with the horizon and a broad forehead, distinct features and full flowing beard. Stamp him with the superiority and a majesty denied to all other creatures and relatively to all other races of men. The narrow and longitudinal head of the Negro projected posteriorly, placing his eyes at angle with the horizon and thus alone enables him to approximate to an erect position. So the black man could not cast his eyes to the heaven and stand as man. He was contem condemned by his inferior race to bow to all of nature, most notably the white man. Posture and color were not the sole or most important features that indicated manhood or personhood in the civilizational maturation of a race for Van Every. That honor belonged to the beard. The Caucasian alone has a beard for all others approximate to it with this respect. It is only the beard is the only bearded race people. <laughs> and some writers, it just sounds silly reading and I apologize. <laughs> and some writers of ethnology have been so impressed with the imposing and striking distinction that they have sought to make it the basis of a classification of races. And there certainly is no physical or outward quality that so imposingly impresses itself on the senses as a mark of superiority or evidence of supremacy as a full flowing beard, end quote. The beard was a mark of the ethnological order, the evidence of the superior place, the masculine, the white masculine race was afforded the civilizational design of the divine. And every believed that the social status of man, and this is very important, the social political character of manhood that configured the hierarchy of the citizen belonged to the white man because the black man was not a man. And, it's, and, and the reason I'm speaking in these terms is because ethnology was a metric of racial evolution based on the study of men. So if I'm, if I'm an antebellum ethnologist, I'm looking back into history and I'm seeing what have men achieved. And based on the achievements of men, that's what allows me to rank different groups. And once we get to evolution, this is going to change because post in the in the postbellum era, where you're going to see like in America and the UK with the dawn of colonialism and evolution is feminist and suffragists actually claiming that they are men, that they are part of a masculine patriarchal race and that they either author it or demonstrated in superiority to the feminine black race. But we're not there yet because evolution hasn't kicked in racial distinctions or sexuals. So in proving that the black man is not a man, Van Every argues that the intellect, the mental strength, and the moral beauty, all the qualities of the inner being, as well as those outward attributes tangible to the sense, harmonize perfectly with the growth of the beard. And when that has reached its full development, it is both the signal and the proof for mature manhood, an exact measurement and absolute proof of the maturity of the individual, as well as the type and the standard of the race. So you see the physiognomy still coming through right, in, in this ethnological period. This is equally true when applied to different races. The Caucasian is the only bearded race, but all others approximate in this respect. And the Negro, furthest removed from all, for tropical woolly hair, African or Negro, except a little tough on the chin and sometimes on the upper lip, has nothing that could be confounded with a beard, end quote. So Every's ethnological schema was not altogether novel uh, prior to the Civil War. 
As the historian Melissa Stein explains, secondary sex characteristics like body and facial hair were of keen interest to white scientists both during and after the Civil War. So the need to verify manhood of black men during the Civil War was a much more dire concern in 1863 in the Union Army, Army because they actually commissioned the Sanitary Commission to measure, quote, the most important physical dimensions and personal characteristics of diverse male bodies to who their work afforded access. Uh, what's important about this, this genealogy, because I know I'm probably pushing up on time. Uh, what, what, what's important about this genealogy is that it shows that our debates about Enlightenment era thinking had to expand beyond what we have disciplinary and canonically called that era. Uh, the development and the transmission of these ideas did not stop at whether or not there are racial taxonomies, whether, you know, if you're following Blumenblatt, whether or not these people are beautiful or ugly on a racial or ordering scheme, or even more so, even if you're talking about the teleological development of races, depending on what version of Kant you read, it doesn't end with that designation. The insidious part of racism is precisely that it spurned new areas of inquiry for Europeans to take up and that these are in fact part of philosophical anthropology and the philosophical sciences. And we constantly remove philosophy from that kind of debate and discourse because we don't trace physiognomy and ethnology as philosophical disciplines. What I think this shows is that the Enlightenment era and its development both into the physiognomical and the ethnological, that shows that we have, we have so much more work to do and that we've been in fact placing the emphasis of our debate on figures that we cherish and want to protect as canonical, rather than looking at the expansion and impact that those ideas have for justifications of slavery that we find both reprehensible and immoral. So thank you. Okay, um, I will call on people and I believe someone has a microphone there. So, yes. Thanks very much, that was fascinating. But I've got a, a, a genuine question, sort of puzzlement, and mm -hmm. I'm hoping you help me with. So this is relating to Hegel. So I'm not defending any of the things you quoted, sure. et cetera. But what is interesting, as I'm sure you know, in the phenomenology, in the observing reason section, he Hegel has a lot of fun <laughs> ridiculing the kinds of things that you're you know, criticizing. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, physiognomy, phrenology, but also very crude attempts to link, you know, um, environment to character, etc. Mm -hmm. So what's puzzling me is um, he doesn't. That doesn't seem to fit the narrative you were tracing mm -hmm. quite. So, yeah, I just wondered if you had any thoughts about that and and whether that complicates things at all. Not really, because I mean, Hegel's Hegel's philosophy of history still maintains a different origin or articulation of how black people are removed and not civilized. He's basically describing geographies where reason and consciousness especially have not yet reached. While I think that he makes fun of the, the kinds of sciences of his day, he still reaches the same conclusion. And the purpose of, of my citing of those pieces were more so to show that the sensual nature that Hegel described was folded into some of the ethnological arguments that you're finding in the United States that were made by people like Thomas Jefferson, Pritchard, et cetera there's not gonna be complete agreement. Like I said, if you look at the German tradition of ethnography versus ethnology, you will find arguments about whether or not phrenology, chronometry, or even you know, physiognomy were legitimate sciences. The question though is how did those disciplines like Lavater or how did the ethnologists at the turn of the century still draw upon those authors as a source of inspiration for both reading history and civilization? So if we take Hegel's argument seriously, Egypt's not in Africa because it's a Semitic orientation of race. Northern Africa meant that was part of Asia. Hegel started that argument, but that became part of the evidence that biblical ethnologists used to suggest there wasn't any civilization of the African race and that Africa had produced no great genius. So while he may in fact disagree with phrenology, he certainly does have a Semitic account that robbed Africa and large parts of Asia of being part of a, a civilizational narrative or even being capable of philosophy. So I think that though there are going to be those debates, you see those contradictions all around. I mean, look, the guy that wrote the, uh, that did the introduction for the correspondence of Kant's uh, writings by Cambridge said that uh, Kant completely rejected Lavater's insistence that we should try to create physiognomy. Now, what's interesting about that is Lavater wrote the letters in 1774. By the time you get to 1790, you see Kant already making a whole section on physiognomy in you know pragmatic anthropology. So how do we explain that contradiction, right? Like there are going to be developments and changes all the way through. Question is, 
they seem to be all in agreement about Negro inferiority. And then how are those different apparatuses or opinions taken up in a disciplinary approach of physiognomy or ethnology in the early 1800s? Um, well, why don't, we'll get here, but why don't we go right behind you just because the mic's there, but I'll make sure to get you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. And I was wondering if um, you have considered how the story, history of ideas that you developed relates to a similar debate concerning the Native Americans below the United States. Mm -hmm. The debate uh, starting in Spain on whether Native Americans had a soul oh, yeah. and whether there's a similarity in the structure of the development of the ideas in the Anglo-speaking world or mm -hmm. um, Central Europe to the debates that we're having in Spain and other parts of the world. Yeah, no, I think about that all the time because you see references to to different arguments and articulations. I can't read Spanish. I can only do French and English. So that's why I focus on the Anglo and French world. But I can I can tell you, so I know in the mid-20th century, the debates are the same. You know, and, and this is why this is why I say that as philosophers and, and intellectual historians, we have to be so careful with challenging the canonical interpretations of figures as the basis of how we try to participate in a conversation, right? Like the, the rest of the world was affected by colonialism and really, you know, racism to a very real extent. It determined the kinds of debates that we're having. And I can tell you, because I teach a class in, in 19th century ethnology here, when students actually sit down and read this stuff, and then they, because, the, I mean, this is the funniest part about it, and, and this really does talk about how we don't think about these things applying across the board. When we read ethnology, we start in 18, basically the 1800s, and we go all the way to, we do the antebellum and then we do the postbellum. Well, the problem is when you get to the postbellum, you run into a big movement in America, the suffrage movement, right? So then those suffragists were ethnologists, and those suffragists were writing arguments about what they encountered in Native men when they went to colonies. So when you start reading what white women are talking about with these Native men and boys, it's a completely different scenario. It's not about freedom. That's just a heads up, right? So... If, if we're looking at different geographies in different places, we in many ways have to suspend the way that our disciplines have told us that certain things mean things, right? So I know, for instance, that there's a very real concrete overlap between, say, how the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Dutch colonized various parts of the Caribbean and South America, et cetera. What that ends up looking like, because I don't know who their top ethnologists are, right? Who knows? But there were there was no liberatory thought during this period of time. So coming out of Europe. So we pretty much know that given the dominant trends, that is probably in line with it. Yeah. Thank you for this very stimulating sure. talk. So I was wondering what would be your stance against enlightenment as discourse. So you seem to carry out a phenomenology or genealogy of physiognomy in Enlightened thinkers, but would that necessarily connect to their philosophies? So is it this an irony that Hegel himself is the philosopher of thinking freedom, slavery? So mm -hmm. my question would be, what, what in the end would be the philosophical framework for you to critically assess the problem of slavery after you dismiss enlightenment as a discourse? So... So for Two you, questions. For you to be is able. This for me. That's what I was asking. Is it my? Is it my personal thing? Or? So, no, no. For us to be able okay. to critically assess slavery, mm -hmm. wouldn't that be necessary to adopt some sort of enlightened discourse? No. What What that discourse would be like then? Black people who said slavery was wrong. <laughs> on 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 what condition would Would you say? Because it violates their personhood. Because it, it violates their person. Like, if you know, here, here's so here's the thing. The it's always interesting to me that we presuppose we both criticize the Enlightenment for these these horrible subpersonhoods. I'll, I'll I'll kind of riff on Charles here. This this creation of subpersonhood, but then we think that the only solution to the subpersonhood problem is retreating into the disease that created subpersonhood. That seems to make no sense to me. What we have with black people are two things. One, a rejection of the idea that their natural position is enslavement because we have their writings. And two, you have the idea that they literally killed the white people trying to enslave them. Now, on one political and both the theological slash philosophical level, why can't we construct a worldview based on those sentiments that need not be verified or validated by a universal appeal to the human, et cetera? Because these people are working from the position they're, they're denied their humanity, 
They're simply refuting the idea that black people are created as animals, are created as subpersonhoods, et cetera. What in enlightenment thinking do you think is necessary to refute its own creation? Just that they should be assimilated humanity to humanity as a universal concept. Exactly. But the, the problem is, is that that humanity comes with it an entailment of subpersonhood. So why would black people who are victims of subpersonhood want to be humans like their oppressors? Right. And that's what I mean when I say that we have to displace the canonical presupposition. Is it only Europeans that get to start with a prior assumptions to do philosophical projects that they're irrational? It's my question. Aren't you commenting the same thing to Europeans? in attributing oh. them to so enlightened discourse would be a discourse for white europeans okay okay but no but but that's how the world works right like that's what i mean it's not it's not like it's not like you have black people that are forcing white people into this position of oppressors you have white people claiming they are the oppressors right you have you have them saying we're the only group that evolved to oppress people and god ordained it so i'm not that's just what european philosophy did if black people want to step away from that and say we don't want that kind of humanity is there not the possibility of thinking new ideas that don't have to appeal to that trajectory? Said differently, is it necessary that if we do something like Eastern philosophy or indigenous philosophy or feminist philosophy, that it has to live by the rules of the dominant philosophy it criticizes? And if it's not the case, which we seem to accept within most publishing houses and within the Western Academy, why is it necessary for black people? Why must they depend on a kind of discourse that created both the institutions and the ideas of their own subjugation and death? Surely we can look at other models of what they've refuted against and what they've written and what they say they're not as a basis to simply reject that proposition and start thinking about new forms of humanity. Um, there's a hand here. Was there a hand here? Yeah. And then we'll go back there. Hi. Thank you very much for that excellent uh, talk. Thank um, you. You mentioned Frederick Douglass and mm -hmm. that uh, he said blacks are man, but this must have been a direct kind of response to the ethnology that mm. said that, that blacks weren't men. I wondered what your thoughts were about Maria W. Stewart, who mm -hmm. was um, giving sermons around the same time a little bit earlier. Yeah, she's a little she, um, I, I suppose she's claiming that black women are also men in the sense mm -hmm. you were talking about, um, or if she was responding in a similar way. And just a little tiny footnote, I wonder if the beard stuff originally comes from Galen, mm -hmm. who goes on and on about beards, how yeah. great beards are. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they cite that. They cite it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Some of them do. Some of them do. Uh, so so here's the thing, right? So in the 1830s, when, when it's Maria Stewart's you know, doing her thing, uh, she's making certain kind of arguments and claims about a, a certain kind of Christian and godlike soul and element. Uh, that she thinks empowers everyone to be both recognized as a human being and speak the word of God. Okay. So that the problem is we misread that. So in the 1830s, there was not the concept of woman that exists that allows us to do that reading. And this is a major point of contention that I have with people who just kind of revise things because we're black and we just pick up a political posture. David Walker, when he wrote, you know, his appeal systematically goes through and says, here's what, here's what white supremacy says, that we belong to be slaves. Here's what God says. Here's what the Bible says. These things don't match up. Stewart makes a riff on Walker and says, if we, here's what God says. He makes no distinctions about whether or not I can speak the word of God. Now, what we've done is we've said, well, this is a gender issue because she's a woman trying to speak in the AME. But the AME is based off of how black people are reading the precepts of Christianity and the Methodist church. So there is a certain ethno ethnological import to the men speaking about God as a refutation of the arguments during this period of time that black people could not have man-like accomplishments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think Maria Stewart is fine doing what she's doing, right? But I think we're mistranslating the meaning of that because what we're doing is we're saying, as a black woman, she did X, Y, and Z. But that's not how she would have thought about those terms. Her her gender became important, or what we, her sex really became important to that period of time because she was in the AME church. Outside of that, there is no reference at all to race to sex distinctions as a basis of evolution within racial discourse. Because race racial slash sex distinctions are postbellum terms, not antebellum terms. Does that make sense? Yeah. So important. It's historically important, but. 
What I think, you know, and, I, and this has been my criticism of how we do race theory generally, we import our present categories into a political posture where the significance of what she did was about universalizing who that blacks could speak the word of God rather than it being a sex role issue. And that becomes really, really important. That, that distinction is just so important because you don't get the development of gender distinctions as we know it or begin to get it until after you get free black men, because that's what triggers the split of the sex roles for white people, because they've evolved to such a point that white patriarchy or what we would call white patriarchy or the masculine element is needed to safeguard the development of the female element in the home. Right. So those debates happen when you get free black men and their threats to those to those evolutionary tenets of the white race. Uh, thanks. So I'm interested in the, the continuities that you're talking about between the Enlightenment philosophy that we often sort of valorize and want to keep mm -hmm. uh, and ideas like physiognomy. And I was always really interested by the idea that Justin Smith's got in nature, human nature and human difference that we often think about the transition from a sort of Cartesian soul body dualism to a naturalized picture of man as being this big advance, this great progress. Mm -hmm. But he argues that, you know, you couldn't have something like physiognomy while you're a Cartesian dualist because right. what we are are souls and the body is just superficial mm -hmm. uh, exterior. And that we need this sort of naturalization to be able to put humans in a sort of Linnaean taxonomy yeah, yeah. to put some people at the top and some at the bottom. So I was wondering, number one, whether you buy that. And then number two, what the sort of philosophical presuppositions of our concept of man, our metaphysics of man are, if you want no, to call it great, that. That's a great question. Ask for it. Yeah, I think, look, I, I think that's probably right. I mean, I haven't read the book, so, I, you know, I'm always says like, I agree without reading it. But um, I just think that's a bad practice. <laughs> but given what you've said, I tend to agree. And I think what makes philosophy very, very messy is the lack of nuance and historicization of ideas. So people often criticize me as not being a philosopher because I like the history of ideas. I go, I'll go find a footnote and read it in a heartbeat, right? But that creates an inconvenience because we like to talk in generalities. And it makes sense, right? If, you, if you're just working from a Cartesian metaphysics where you've got a cogito in this flaccid body that's interrupted it, then yeah, it, doesn't, it really doesn't make sense to talk about a physiognomic argument because there would be no interiorization, right? Because you're just talking brutally about doubt. There's not the same kind of anthropological assumptions or qualities that would be involved. So you need to have some kind of pre-formulations of ideas that build upon one another. And I don't think those are always necessarily true, right? It doesn't mean that just because something comes after something, there's a necessary link to it. What's fascinating me about the relationship between Enlightenment era thinking and physiognomy and ethnology is that they're all cited and saying the same thing. And it's a really tremendous example of seeing that, where you're constantly getting people making arguments, even in biblical or antebellum ethnology, about how the interior qualities of a race matter and how you can tell because, like, for example, the one the one quote they say about, because uh, it's very rare in ethnology you get to pick out quotes about women, but one of the things they say is you can tell the purity of a white woman because when she becomes, you know, excited or amorous, she blushes. But the negress, you can't do that because her melanin stops any blush, right? So that kind of argument requires you to have a certain assumption or a certain way of reading what the countenance of a body is. And that's why physiognomy is so important to ethnology. But as you saw from what I quoted with Lavater, Lavater's quoting Kant. He's talking about Hume. He's talking about all these people that we define as ethnological thinker, or I'm sorry, uh, Enlightenment era thinkers. And we basically don't study Lavater. And it's a terrible book, right? I mean, it's, it's silly. But nonetheless, given that he has letters with Kant, given that physiognomy is a real thing during this period of time, and that, you know, one of the, per the people that actually translated and brought his work over to the UK was in Edinburgh, like this guy named Murray that was running a printing, pr printing press out here, I think is pretty significant for how we're trying to interpret this specific problem around the Enlightenment. So yeah, I would say, I would say yes, that you need to have certain requisites. And in terms of the metaphysics of man, like, you know, I read people like Winter, I read people like Newton, you know, <sighs> The problem is when you try to naturalize a kind of philosophical anthropology in that way, you often end up over determining the kind of man that's present in our time. And so, for example, if I'm reading ethnology and I'm giving you a philosophical anthropology, it makes no sense for me to talk about women unless we're talking about past 1860. Right. Because everything is ranked based on how we understand men, like men become feminine in ethnology precisely because there are no separations of racial kind versus non-racial kinds, right? So if I'm talking about a philosophical anthropology, it has to come with that kind of awareness that the time that we're speaking about now is historiographically limited. 
because if we fast forward 20, 30 years or another century, then all of our assumptions become just like that, the logical assumptions. They're passe and they're not universal. And what I feel we do in our own time is constantly trying to universalize the metaphysics of what we describe empirically as if it somehow has, ha, somehow has some inner insight of the interiority or beyond, beyond space and time that will always be. And I just think that's a bankrupt project because we basically, excuse my friend, we're just making shit up. Right. And that's what we and, and honestly, that's what we do. We, we make shit up. We, we moralize it. You get a whole bunch of white people come to a room and say, yeah, it's true. And then we use that as the basis of doing philosophy within people's lifetime. And what I'm suggesting is if we take a more careful view and assume perhaps that there are contingent versions of humanism or even anti-humanism that we can trace throughout history, that we have a much easier time making a situational and contingent case against how for some forms of metaphysics are simply not true. Said differently, given if we trace the philosophical anthropology, we could actually find the existential qualifiers rather than constantly operating as if the universals hold in all cases. Um, there were a couple hands here. Um, yeah, right there. Yeah, yeah, you. Thanks very much. That was super interesting. Um, I want, I'm want. i wondering how far back some of this goes, right? So sure. um, <clears throat> as you may well know, right, Aristotle has a defense of slavery mm -hmm. where you know there are people for whom it's natural and just to be enslaved because they lack some kind of deliberative capacity. And then there's a question about, well, why does he think such people exist? And he also has some stuff about meteorological determinism, right? So if you are born and brought up in a certain part of the world, you have less logos, less reason, or yeah. less, and you have more spirit. Um, and I also know that Aristotle gets brought up in antebellum debates, like cited. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering whether, worrying about people's legacies, whether, is that a kind of an early version of this kind of, I guess a physiology science doesn't come out of it, right? Right, no. But no, is, no. It like an, is it like an early version of it? And does he have a role to play in any of this, you know, the kind of people that are being cited from your research? Yeah, um, I mean, so they mention them. You know, but it's, listen, this is, look, Europe is a constructed project, okay? So I find all kind of stuff that's really, you know, unsightly. Like they quote Aristotle, they quote Hegel, they quote, I mean, they, they're trying to, constantly trying to refute Herder, they quote Voltaire. You know, you find all kind of tidbits when you read this crap because they're just searching for footnotes that will try to prove their, their claim is true. Uh, but, you know, I mean, even the way that we look at, you know, Aristotle, you know, this is, this is something that you actually get when you read the laws, right? You know, when you, when you read Plato, he makes his claim in the laws that the way that you actually find natural states, you know, what we talk about in the Republic is because he went to North Africa, sat there and the Ethiopians and Egyptians play music in the polis, in the cities. They actually do this. And then this becomes the basis of him making the argument of the Republic, right? It's his own book. He just says, this is what happened. I went there. Herodotus went there. These are the things that happened. Nobody cites that, <laughs> right? Um, you look over that. Like, we don't teach that. So what is that? Why is that important? Well, it's important because when you say something like, you know, what Aristotle is saying, often it has some sort of context. Right. And I'm not a I'm not an ancient historian, so I don't know. But theoretically or conceptually it would have some sort of context. And that context tells us how it could potentially be used. So when people are constructing this narrative, like somehow, you know, Greek, Greek people who thought everybody was barbaric, but then suddenly you got these little Anglo-Saxons that's probably scurrying around in forests at that point, somehow are the same. It's a lie. It's an error. It's, it's just a myth. So what you have is a constant constructor where people are utilizing different aspects of what they take to be white civilization, to denigrate other darker races. And I just think we have to keep that in mind. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I mean, I don't think we could implicate, you know, Aristotle on some kind of natural anti-black racism. He was certainly ethnocentric. Right. But I think that we need to be able to point out that this idea Right. This idea of difference of ethnocentrism becomes something that's utilized in the enlightenment of modern era that is brought to bear on the project. Right. And I, and I think that's the I think that's the impact of the work we do as philosophers, not to attribute original intent, but to talk about how in the construction of the ideas in Europe, this becomes important. Thanks, no problem. OK, we, we started five minutes late, so we're going to go another five minutes, if that's all right. With Just fine. Curry. Yeah, I understand people might have to leave. Uh, go ahead. Thank you very much for the talk and for the conversation so far. One of the things you've done very well is show to us that if we're going to talk about Enlightenment philosophy, we should take into account its shadow mm -hmm. figure. But what comes to my mind when you mentioned the Haitian Revolution is Toussaint Louverture, who was not only the leader of the Haitian Revolution, but was an Enlightenment intellectual in his own right. Mm -hmm. What do you make of that combination? <laughs> That's why he died in jail before the revolution was over. 
It's also why he's in the Pantheon in France. Yeah, well, this is and your and your oppressor validates you. Congratulations after they try to kill you, right? But see, this is this is a really good point, right? So CLR James has a direct discussion about this in the Black Jacobins, where he's like, listen, you know, the friends of the black people, you know, Lamy like Duvar, you know, inevitably took you know Louverture's advances as an a product of Enlightenment thinking, and they failed. They, they imprisoned him for treason, basically, right? And who did it take? It took Dessalines to come in, kill all the white people, and free the republic. So to me, that speaks about the limitation of Enlightenment era thinking to actually get something done and why you don't trust your oppressors. Because Louverture saw himself as making a claim for the emancipation of Haiti precisely on the basis that he can prove that they were human beings and free. And then you have people like C.L.R. James saying, well, look, here's the dead end of your notion of humanism. Because you're still black and you're still basically a colony of France, that positionality that Fanon talks about as non-being doesn't allow you that recognition. So the idea that you're a human being is punished by you staying in jail and dying while the revolution is going on. Because the re re revolution is successful, not by enlightenment thinking, but by the anti-humanist Dessalines, who says that you have to kill all these people so that you can let free black people rule the island and bring about their own destiny. So self-determination and self-governance is the is the refutation of La, La Mie de Noir, not the fulfillment of it. And I think that when you look at the arguments like James Theodore Halle, if you're looking at even how Frederick Douglass reads Haiti, they're not reading this as the success of enlightenment. Yay. I know that's what we're told because people, I mean, I know, like, I know the scholarship. I know the authors. I know that's what they say. But there's no textual evidence to support that claim. Because even if you go back to James McCoon Smith, who's like the most educated black person of the of the 1800s and got his Ph.D. here at Glasgow, he says that he um, admires Louverture. But he says that the failure and limitation of Louverture was that he didn't understand the political economy behind the slave plantation and, uh, and system that inevitably meant that he would fail. So then you look at somebody like Delaney and Delaney's talking about Dessalines. John Edward Bruce is talking about Dessalines. So you have black intellectuals framing Louverture, though he's courageous and made an argument as a failure of certain sort of precepts that black people can be folded into the recognition of humanity. And I think that's a very, very powerful example of how it could get you so far, but it can't get you to the complete uh, freedom and liberation of the Republic. Um, here, I mean, uh, thank you so much for your talk. Um, it was really fascinating. I have a question about what you think um, about the rise of sort of interest in science and natural science and mm -hmm. how philosophers get very invested in science as kind of being not just necessary, but even sufficient for philosophical thinking by kind of the late 17th century after mm -hmm. kind of in the wake of Cartesianism, but mostly in the 18th century, in fact. That's when it seems to really yeah, take yeah. hold. And that coincides with a claim to the effect that there's absolutely no philosophy to be found outside of Greece. And then people hold on to Aristotle and say, well, Thales is the first philosopher. And I mean, yeah. you can disagree about whether Aristotle really said that. And I would say he didn't. But I think what's really interesting is that what, what you pointed out with physiognomy and um, sort of raciology, pseudoscientific theories mm -hmm. is um, they become relevant kind of at that time when sort of science becomes a mm -hmm. real battleground, I think, for kind of determining whether there's philosophy or not um, amongst different races. And of course, the investment in races itself seems to be happening at the same time, Absolutely. kind of as a result. Um, and so how does that relate to your account with physiognomy, kind mm -hmm. of that sort of the rise of naturalism and kind of this um, emphasis on scientific thought? And I was thinking as well about Hume, right, where initially he seems to sort of waver about whether there might be science mm -hmm. outside of Greece. You know, China may have had some science, but they had the wrong sort of government. But then yeah, yeah. 10 years later, it's like, well, no, they couldn't have done it just because mm -hmm. they're not white. And so it seems like there's it's always a- the answer though, isn't it? <laughs> it's like, oh no, I thought, but they're not white. Yeah, so I was just wondering about sort of how that plays into your account. I mean, oh, I I mean yeah. No, thanks for the question. Listen, so so here's the thing, you know, I, I guess I kind of work from, from the underside of like history, right? So I know, I know the answer to everything that white people are gonna say, it's like, they're not white, so they can't do science. So we need a science to tell us that they're not white and that they can't do science. Like that's literally how everything happens, right? I'm, I'm you're know, laughing. I'm so serious, right? Like it's so you you see these you see these options. This is why Hume's, Hume's footnote's funny to me, because Hume's footnote is not really different than any. I mean, I can read Voltaire and find racist stuff, right? It's not that different. But what's interesting about it is remember, you know, this is the guy that doesn't think the sun. Now that I live here, 
I see why he thought that. The sun doesn't rise. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, it's very difficult having this color skin and like, you know, trying to get some sun. Um, but 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 this is a person that that argues against, you know, causality in, in a large part, at least the presumption that it, that it's there. But then you get him making these very strong exceptional claims about certain causal relationships in anthropology, right? Uh, and he says, of course, well, I'm not sure if it's the physical causes. I don't know why, but we know definitively the outcome. And that's what I mean. Like, they're not white. That's the outcome part. So you're trying to work backwards to figure out a way to rationalize and legitimize the outcome part. And what you see happening throughout the Enlightenment, et cetera, is that the focus on race doesn't mediate itself. And what I mean by that is there's not a discussion where there's a back and forth. There's like, here's the outcome. We could change the outcome and some people may disagree, but the outcome is what's driving everything. National politics, economics, enslavement, et cetera. And that's why I say that when we have the philosophical argument, like you could take Locke, you could take Kant, whoever the case may be, that argument isn't outweighing what the nations in Europe itself is doing. So the science comes about to justify this outcome because it's what's being taught and is being made into a canon throughout the Western world. Right. So I think that there's two things. There is the move. Right. There is the move to make things more scientific. But the question becomes, what's fueling that move and the legitimation of knowledge? And that's really trying to locate science away from art, because this is really the debate that Lavender is having throughout the book. Is physiognomy and art right where we can kind of intuit like the sublime. Right. This kind of natural genius and feeling of what is on the interior of the heart. Or is it a science that can be reduced to a rule and an axiom that we could use? So I think that that's I mean, I think that's just what's happening. I think Europeans find things. They don't know what it means. So they make something up. And then other Europeans say, oh, that sounds cool. I'll agree with you. And then they form a society. danger of the kind of consensus that's surrounding these kinds of debates. Like in my work, I'm constantly talking about the power of white consensus. So like, you know, and, and one of the more stark examples of this is for me was Royce. Like all these people who did Royce for 20 years was just wrong, just flat out wrong. There's no debate about it. It's wrong, right? You didn't read enough. You got caught with your pants down. We can move on, but they can't because a whole bunch of white people just agree that this is the case. And this happens right now in like organizations like SAP. So imagine if you're like in an ethological society or imagine if you're in an all white society like the UK, your consensus and agreement investigation and inquiry. You say that we've decided this is the case. So, let so the, the, the naturalism that we presuppose is a very particular kind of perspective, is a, is a very particular perspective about how you want this particular civilization and mode of the human being to interact with nature, interact with different kinds or interact with society. Right. And I think that's what spurns the gift or the, the problem of disciplinarity. You just have so many flawed assumptions. Right. OK, I'm sorry um, I didn't get to all the questions, um, but we're out of time. But uh, thank you for us. Thank you. That's good to know.